Hey, it's Ryan over at Two Minute Tennis, and this video is all about how to hit a perfect topspin forehand. Please consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell, even sharing this video with a friend, as those are absolutely the best ways to support this channel. Now, I am in my basement, and I'm gonna be using the Topspin Pro. If you're a coach, a parent, or a player, this is an amazing product for at home and on the court practice. I am an affiliate, my link is in the description below. Definitely check out the Topspin Pro. Now, the first thing you always wanna understand when it comes to any stroke is how to hold the racket. Now, let's talk about the hand first, and you can draw these spots on your hand if you'd like, but we wanna understand the base knuckle of the index finger and the heel pad. Now, those two spots have to go on a certain place on your racket. So, first, Always get the racket on its edge before you start looking at the butt cap and understanding the bevels, that just gets the orientation correct. Now, each bevel, and by the way, a bevel is a flat side. I get people who ask me, is the bevel a corner? No, 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 a bevel is a flat side. Each bevel is 45 degrees different than the previous bevel, right? So it's 360 divided by eight, 45. So we wanna understand that because that really impacts the racket at contact and what you can do with the ball. So bevel number one is on the top, whether you're right or left-handed. Bevel two, if you're right-handed, is here. Bevel three, bevel four, bevel five, and so on, all the way to eight. If you're left-handed, we're gonna to count to the left. Bevel one, bevel two, bevel three, bevel four, bevel five. Bevel one, and bevel five are the same whether you're right or left-handed. Now, as a right-hander, the two bevels I recommend players use for their topspin forehand, bevel number three or bevel number four. That's kind of my range of acceptability for players hitting a great and efficient topspin forehand. So bevel number three is the Eastern forehand grip. Think Roger Federer. So to find the Roger Federer forehand grip, you can put your heel pad and your knuckle on bevel number three. What's nice about the Eastern forehand is it connects your palm with where the strings are pointing. So if your palm is facing up, your strings are facing up. Palm facing down, strings are down. Palm facing forward, your strings are facing forward. A vertical racket at contact is in your best interest. So having your palm face that same direction makes it very easy to understand where your strings are facing. Now, bevel number four, the um, Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic grip, is the semi-Western grip. That's actually personally the grip that I use. Bevel number four is heel pad, knuckle, that's the semi-Western grip, and that actually opens up your palm just to understand how the hand changes. Same racket, same vertical racket, but now my palm is open at 45 degrees. Remember, each bevel is 45 degrees different. Just understanding that will actually help you to navigate grip changes, and if you've ever been asked to change your grip by a coach, meaning they don't want you to use a certain grip, they want you to use a different grip, what you can actually just understand is how the, the palm changes not necessarily worry about the racket, but understand how the palm changes, I think it'll make the grip change much easier. Now, there are six forehand topspin checkpoints. And let me demonstrate all six checkpoints first, and then we're gonna go through them. I'm gonna show you from the side, the back, and the front. So checkpoint number one on a topspin forehand is the ready position. Checkpoint number two is the unit turn. Checkpoint three is the drop. Checkpoint four is contact. Checkpoint five is extension. I'm in my basement, so I'm gonna have to modify this a little bit. And checkpoint number six is the finish. Let me show you this from the back. Checkpoint one, checkpoint two, checkpoint three, checkpoint four, checkpoint five, and checkpoint six. And now let me show you this from the front. These checkpoints are awesome because they allow you to record yourself on video and look at your forehand. And you go from checkpoint to checkpoint and you start looking for certain things. And I'm gonna show you what to look for in each checkpoint. But let me show you what it looks like from the front. Checkpoint one, the ready position. Checkpoint two, the unit turn. Checkpoint three is the drop. Checkpoint four is the contact. 
Checkpoint five is extension and checkpoint six is the finish. I'm having to choke up on my racket to go from checkpoint five to checkpoint six. Again, just because the drop ceiling in my basement is so low. So let's first, actually we'll do the, the front view first. Uh, checkpoint number one. To have a great ready position, um, first you have to have the grip. So either use the Eastern or the semi-Western grip. But we wanna make sure that we start with the body first and we understand what the body should be doing. So you wanna have a wider stance than you think you should with the knees bent. And we wanna make sure that we are split stepping as our opponent hits the ball. Now to be more specific, and if you don't believe me, go look at slow motion footage of pros hitting back and forth. The proper timing, and I actually used to teach this incorrectly years ago. Um, and about a decade ago, I started noticing, oh my gosh, what I've been saying is actually incorrect. And the proper timing on the split step is actually to be in the air as your opponent makes contact. What we want to do is actually land our split step slightly after the opponent hits the ball. And what that does is it synchronizes when our brain reacts, like right, our, our reaction time, when our brain reacts to where the ball is going with when our feet hit the ground. So when you can land as your brain is realizing where to go, you're so much faster in your first step. So practice being in the air as your opponent hits the ball. A quick search on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook in slow motion footage of the pros rallying, you'll notice that the pros are actually in the air as the ball is hit by the opponent and they land after contact. Check it out if you don't believe me. Trust me, I know no matter which video you watch, you'll see that that is true. So feet wide, knees bent, you should almost look like the letter A, very athletic stance. Your elbows, get your elbows out away from you. I wish I, you know what's funny is I don't even actually have tennis balls in my basement, but what I do to demonstrate this when I'm actually teaching a lesson is I put tennis balls under my armpits and then I lift my elbows out until the balls drop and then the elbows are correct. You want your elbows out away from your body, that's gonna help whether you're hitting a forehand or a backhand, that'll help get the second checkpoint I'm gonna show you in a second to be correct. Each checkpoint's job is to help the next checkpoint be correct. So if we can have a great ready position, it's gonna help us in our unit turn. So we've got our grip, We've got our feet wide, knees bent, split stepping as our opponent hits the ball, and our elbows are out. Be sure that your racket is not down. Have a ready, ready position. It's not called a starting position, and it's not called a waiting position. Have a ready position with your elbows out. Now, the unit turn. As soon as you see the ball coming, you should begin the unit turn. Now I'm not saying you have to get your racket back really fast. That's not what I'm saying, that you have to rush and yank the racket back. But what I do want you to try is once, you, let's say, you know, obviously it's a forehand coming to you, once you see the ball come off your opponent's racket, that you begin the turn. If you're someone, let's say it's on a return of serve and you have both hands on the grip because you are a two-hander, as you turn, you can slide your left hand onto the throat of the racket what I recommend is that players have their index finger on the strings, just gives a great awareness and, uh, of what the racket head is doing. But when you turn, turn with the body turning. Don't think of it as the racket's pulling back. Remember, your elbows are out. I tell my students, let me smell your armpits. Like if they're across, like, come on, I should smell your armpits, don't cover it up. Like if your armpits smell, we should all know. Like get your elbows out. When you turn, you're gonna turn with both hands on the racket and all you're doing is just turning the body. Remember, it's called a unit turn. So we don't want it to just be the arm. We want the entire body, synchronization of the body and racket. We want the racket and body taking the racket, I'm sorry, we want the body taking the racket back, both hands on the racket. Gives a nice side stretch, nice coil, and when we coil, we can then uncoil into the shot. So checkpoint number one, ready position. Checkpoint number two, the moment we see that the forehand is coming, we're gonna turn early. You'll notice my left hand, since I'm right-handed, is still on the racket. All I've done is just turn my foot up on the toe, this foot, turning it up on the toe, just in demonstration. You'll see that the racket head is similar to my head, two-headed monster, two heads are better than one, so turn with your elbows out, both hands 
on the racket. Now, as the ball is coming, you're gonna be moving generally, right? You're not gonna be static and just turning the foot on the toe. But just understand in home practice in a small area, there's no ball to chase after. So we gotta, we gotta turn somehow so we can just turn this foot up on the toe. Remember, elbows are out. If the elbow is in, that's when the racket starts opening up and the racket starts going behind me. The strings facing the sky. The strings are facing the sky. It's gonna be very tough for the drop, checkpoint number three, to be correct. So make sure that when you turn, you can see that my strings are slightly closed rather than open. Try to have your strings slightly closed on the turn. It's gonna help you be super consistent. All right, checkpoint number three. You've got your ready position. You're turning with both hands on the racket. Checkpoint three is the drop. Now, I don't call it the racket drop because we aren't just dropping the racket. We're also dropping the body. So there's really, generally in this type of situation, three things that happen all at once. The body is gonna go down, the racket's gonna go down, and our foot's gonna step out. So it's, I just saw a video, I'm gonna have to post this sometime. I just saw a video on Instagram of Nishikori hitting a forehand, and he hit a perfect three-point landing foot going out, body going down, and racket going down. I'll definitely have to share that video on social media at some point soon. So here's the three-point landing. Your body is gonna go down, your left, your left foot, if you're right-handed, is gonna step forward, and your racket's gonna go down. So you can see those three things happening at once. The racket's going down, my body is going down, and my foot is stepping out. It's almost like I'm sitting in a chair. We wanna use the lower links, right? We talk about the kinetic chain. We wanna use the ground and ground force to be able to put energy into the ball. So syncing with the body, we talked about synchronization of the body and racket, where the racket and the body go together on the turn, the racket and the body, when demonstrating this perfect topspin forehand, the body and the racket are gonna go down together as well. Elbows are out, I turn with both hands for checkpoint two, and I drop the racket. Now you'll notice when I drop my racket that my racket is tilted down. That's called a closed racket face. This is one of the biggest mistakes I see amateur players who struggle with their forehand, real players who I teach every day on the tennis court. This is a mistake I see time and time again. It's that players drop their racket on edge. When your racket is on edge in the back, your strings will face to the sky or about 45 degrees open at contact. And it's actually one of the reasons why players don't like to follow through. They're afraid the ball's gonna go out and they're, they're afraid to swing up, which is what you need in order to hit topspin. Well, they're afraid to swing up because they don't close the racket face. So I want you to look at video of yourself hitting a forehand and make sure that when you drop your racket down and drop your body, that you tilt the strings down toward the ground. I would recommend, depending on the grip, it's gonna change slightly, but just anywhere between 30 degrees and 45 degrees is plenty in order to get the contact to be correct. So, we've dropped the body, we've stepped out, our racket is down below the ball, and what we're gonna do to get to contact is we're gonna swing what's called inside out. And this is where the racket is close to us and it's gonna go away. The only way you can hit a top spin forehand is to swing inside out. If you swing outside in, you are getting side spin. So if you're someone who's struggling to get top spin, working on getting farther away from the ball and thinking of your racket going from your back leg away from you to contact is actually how you're gonna be able to hit top spin. Now we talked about going down with our body for checkpoint three. Now we wanna use this energy and push off and come back up to contact, which is where we're gonna be brushing up the back of the ball. A couple things to notice. I've come up with my body. I'm actually facing the target. One of the biggest mistakes I see players is they really open up, right? They, they open up and they pull across and then they end up swinging to the right. Their momentum pulls off to the left. They're late going forward to the net if they hit a good shot. So I want you to feel like you're facing the target more, I'm sorry, the contact more rather than facing the net when you hit the ball. Another thing you'll notice is my non-hitting hand is higher than contact. One mistake I see players making during contact, amateur players, is they drop this, this non-hitting arm. 
If you've ever been told that you hug yourself, if you've ever been told that you hug yourself on your forehand or you can feel it and you're like, you feel like you're in a straight jacket as you're hitting a forehand, it's because you're dropping your non-hitting hand. I would say about six years ago, I noticed something about all high level forehands. And I'm talking about high level at a tennis club all the way up to Serena Williams. They have their non-hitting hand above contact at contact. Even a Del Potro who drops this non-hitting arm, br he brings it back up. Same with Azarenka. They bring it back up by the time contact occurs. Only on the high ball will it be even to contact. Medium balls, lower balls, they always have that non-hitting hand up. So make sure in the video that you take of your forehand, you know what to look for here, that you're making sure that your non-hitting hand is up. That allows the hips to turn to contact. If the non-hitting arm drops, it becomes a counterweight. Every action has an equal and opposite and you start hugging yourself and you cannot turn your hips. So I'm brushing up the back of the ball. What's nice about the Topspin Pro is you can see and feel the topspin, so you get the instant feedback at home that you're actually hitting the topspin that you're looking for. So I'm brushing up the back of the ball, I'm coming up to contact. If you can straighten that front leg by the time you make contact with the ball, all that energy goes into your arm and, and your upper body and the amount of racket speed you get is incredible. Now I'm actually going to show you this next checkpoint from the back and I'm actually, I'm going to use my daughter's racket because I want to make sure I don't hit the ceiling here. One of the mistakes a lot of players make, and whether it's uh, I see it on court or I get asked questions in the comments of my videos or email or direct message, a lot of players talk about the wrist and how much wrist should they be using. Should they be making this move or should they be making this move? I do not like teaching players to use their wrist on their forehand. Um, I believe it just makes amateur players more frustrated uh, than they need to be and they can get plenty of topspin and accomplish the shot that they're looking to hit without recruiting this movement. So if you are someone struggling with consistency on your topspin forehand, I want you to watch very carefully to checkpoint number five, which is the extension. This is actually one of the secrets to Novak Djokovic's two-handed backhand. He does the equivalent of this on his backhand, but let me show it to you on the forehand. You can see my elbows are out, unit turn, both hands on the racket. I drop my body, close the racket in the back. I lift up to contact. My head is still, I'm brushing up the back. I'm coming up, spinning the ball. Non-hitting hand is higher than contact. You can see it, by the way, it's not over here. You can actually see it on the right side of my body from the camera's view as I'm contacting the ball. But here is something that will instantly, if you're a coach, start teaching this to your students who are very wristy and it'll fix their forehand and instantly double how consistent they are. I want you to start focusing on keeping the racket, if you're right-handed, to the right longer. This is what Vic Braden calls, and all this information is Vic Braden information. This is what Vic Braden called the right side of the letter V. Right? So most players are taught get the racket to go up and then the racket goes down. It's the whole like windshield wiper pronation idea. It's all well and good except, I mean, there's no right or wrong way to hit a tennis ball. There's just efficient and inefficient or a way that takes more calculations and a way that takes fewer calculations. I want you to have very few calculations you have to make and then when you're under pressure, you're off balance, you're stressed, um, you have very little time, you'll be consistent. I want you to watch how the racket is still to the right of my hand. If I grab my racket, you'll see, uh, let me grab another racket so you can actually see the V. You can see this is a letter V, right? So my racket, my daughter's racket that I'm using here, you can see this is the right side of the letter V. All this does is it keeps my strings facing my target longer. A lot of players, they make this wristy move and since the tennis court is only 19.6 uh, degrees wide from the center of the court to the corners of the singles court, it's 19.6 degrees wide. 
you start using a lot of wrist, you're, you're hitting the ball left and right and you're not able to hit your target and be precise. So keeping the strings facing forward and facing your target is in your best interest. And the way you can actually do that is by catching the racket in your non-hitting hand and keeping the wrist angle intact. This angle is the angle I had at contact. Now, I can already hear some of you going, I don't see Roger Federer doing this. I don't see, you know, um, Simona Halep doing this on her forehand. You're right, and, and, and I'm sure when you play basketball, you don't do any of the same moves that LeBron James makes. You, you're not doing behind the back perfect passes to an, an open player and you're doing like double pump dunks. We have to understand that, like you could multiply my athleticism by 10 and it probably does not equal Serena Williams. And it, I guarantee you it does not equal anyone in the top 100 in the world. Because of that, we have to do what's best for us. And in order to have maximum control on your forehand, keeping the racket to the same side of your hand longer at contact and after contact helps keep your strings facing your target for a really long time and it instantly boosts your consistency and accuracy. And then that's checkpoint number five. And then checkpoint number six is a finish where you can see that the racket is still to the right of my hand and then I catch the racket high. You can see that my armpits are exposed, chin and shoulder are touching, and then back to the ready position. One thing that I teach often uh, to players on video and on court is the concept of 2-1-2. And it's just the number of hands that are on the racket throughout the stroke. So to simplify everything that I just said, you could just say two, one, two, right? Elbows out. You're gonna turn with two hands, you're gonna hit with one, and you're gonna finish with two hands. So we'll go over it again from the front. Get your grip. Get your elbows out, get your feet out. Be in the air as your opponent hits the ball. That's the proper timing on the split step. That's checkpoint number one. Have a great ready position. Don't be lazy, don't be sloppy, don't have a starting position, don't have a waiting position. Have a ready position, right? Checkpoint number two, let me get my, my own racket. Checkpoint number two, the unit turn. Turn with both hands on the racket. Get this back elbow up. As your elbow drops, it affects the racket. Now the racket's open and it's gonna to be tough to close the racket in the back. Is it impossible to close the racket in the back if your racket's open on the turn? No, look at uh, Rafael Nadal. When he turned, now he didn't used to do this 12 years ago or 15 years ago, his, his forehand technique was cleaner uh, a, a decade ago. But you look at his forehand now, his racket's open. I wouldn't teach that to uh, a beginner or someone who's watching this video for a be for benefit. I would actually teach you the Roger Federer turn where the racket is slightly closed. Turn with both hands on the racket. When your racket's gonna drop, drop your body as well. It helps you get below the ball. And when your racket's down, make sure that when you look at your video that your racket is closed. From here, we're gonna come up to contact with the body. So it's called sitting and lifting, and we're gonna be brushing up the back. Don't roll over the ball, it's impossible to roll over the ball anyway. You can't make that move and actually have it affect contact. The ball's not on the strings long enough. So we're just trying to swing low to high. You'll notice my body's coming up, and my non-hitting hand is higher than contact. And I'm not facing the camera, I'm facing the contact. You, you can almost basically face the net post as you're striking the forehand and you'll have a lot of control. Your body won't be opening up way too much. You're brushing up the back, keeping the wrist not stiff and fixed, just not moving. You don't need to make this move with your wrist. And as an amateur player, maybe you're, you're an average athlete, you're a mom, dad, you're a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, you're someone who's just passionate about tennis, you can't just copy every single thing that the pros do a lot of those things are signature moves that only a world-class athlete could ever do and get away with. So we, we wanna copy the basic bones and structure, not the signatures of the pros. When you swing up, keep the racket, if you're right-handed, to the right of your hand. Again, from the back, to understand this, keep the racket to the right of your hand and, you'll be, and go up. T tennis is a lifting sport. 
The more you swing up, the more the ball comes down. Swing up toward the ceiling. Trust it because your strings are going to be facing forward as you hit the ball. Strings are not going to be, we don't want to swing toward our target. We want to swing up with the strings facing forward. That imparts the topspin. The ball goes up off of our racket and the topspin pulls it back down. And then catch the racket high in your non-hitting hand. Two, one, two. This is an amazing product. The fact that I get to make videos for you here at home uh, in my kind of basement studio and use the Topspin Pro for at-home practice and demonstration just shows you how amazing this product is. Again, I'm an affiliate. Check out the link in the description below. Please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell, sharing this video with a friend or family member who needs to learn how to hit a Topspin forehand, a perfect Topspin forehand. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your support. Let me think or let me know what you think in the comments below and I'll talk to you really soon.